This video is the second in a series of videos about six ways to communicate with the STM32 F103 C8 T6. In the first video, I described the steps required to get from nothing to blinking an LED on the STM32 module. That way you know that it's doing something. In this video, I continue in that theme by covering GDB and the UART terminal interface. Although I covered GDB a little bit in the last video, I believe that the ability to use a real debugger is an important tool in developing code. Many other platforms, as well as normal software development, many people simply depend on printfs find that it has some real disadvantages. GDB can really make things easier. Here I have the GDB init file that I used to initialize GDB and connect it to the STM32. At the beginning, I have some convenience environment variables. Here's where I tell GDB how to talk to the device. In this section, I have a macro for restarting the device. This macro is used to reload the ELF file into the module. Here's a GDB session. Looking at the beginning here, we see that the program has been reloaded into the memory as requested in the GDB init file. We now are here at the main prompt. At this point, we can step through the program simply by hitting next, next, next. We can step into the subroutines and do all of the things that we do when debugging. So that's the GDB. Now let's talk about how to communicate to the device using UART. Let's talk about the hardware that we need. As was the case in the previous video, you need, of course, the module itself. You need the ST-Link programmer. In addition to that, for UART, you need an FTDI adapter. In order to connect that FTDI adapter, you probably want some DuPont cables. All the code that I'll be talking about in this video can be found on my GitHub. Next, we will need to add some additional boilerplate to our project. Coming into STM Cube MX, I've loaded in the configuration for the Blinky program of the previous video. Once in here, there's only a few steps you need to take. First, we need to enable UART. Here, go to a synchronous mode. Next, we need to do some configuration. Coming here to the USART1. For receiving data over UART, I found that it's most convenient to use a circular DMA-based buffer. To do that, we'll go to add, click up here for select, to select the direction, Rx. And then down here, we'll want to select circular. Coming over here into the NVIC settings for the interrupt, we want to make sure that we have the USART interrupt enabled. This will be essential for transmitting data and regenerate our source code. Now that we've generated the boilerplate, let's talk a little bit about what was generated. The document that I found most helpful in programming the STM32 is the UM1850 document on the STM32 F1 HAL drivers. In this case, the section we care about most is section 41, HAL UART generic driver. In particular, there's the how to use this driver. All of the details of the how to use this driver for initialization are done for you by the boilerplate code that is generated by STM cube. The part that we care about is poly mode and interrupt mode operation, as well as receiving data through DMA. Coming into our main source file, let's first talk about transmission. Here we are in our main loop. HAL get tick gets incremented once every millisecond. So assuming that the things that we're doing in here take longer than a millisecond, this will be called once per second. Here we are alternating between transmitting in polling mode. This is a blocking function. You simply give it the huart1 handle, which is defined in uart.h, also generated by STM cube. You pass it the data you want to send, as well as the length of your message. This last argument is how long you want to wait before timing out. In this case, I transmit a constant message defined here, as well as the contents of the current received buffer. We will talk about that in a minute. As an alternate to polling mode based transmission, you can also do it in interrupt based mode. To switch to interrupt based mode is as simple as adding the I underscore IT suffix to the function. Otherwise, the arguments are the same. Note that it is important to have the interrupt enabled when calling this function, even if you don't want to have an interrupt letting you know when it is done. If you do want to know when it's done, you need to define a interrupt handler. The handler name that the hardware abstraction layer looks for is this. This will be called when your UR transmission is complete. Again, you can either have a blocking call or an interrupt base call. And again, in order to use this interrupt base call, interrupts need to be enabled even if you're not going to be using the callback function. To receive data is a little trickier, and there are two options of interest to us. In both cases, you give it a buffer as well as how much data you're expecting. The problem with this is when you're using a typing-based interface. Each of the possible commands that you might be supporting may have a different length, and you don't necessarily know which one will be coming in when. To solve this problem, we simply define a circular buffer, in this case received, which I've defined here. It's very short. In practice, you would probably want it to be longer. In order to get circular buffer behavior, it may require some additional work from you. If you're just using the normal interrupt-based interface, we will read the amount of data requested and then stop. So here in our callback, we'll need to restart it. And that's what happens here. Alternately, we can use a DMA-based circular buffer. In that case, the circularness of it has already been handled for us. Here in the callback, the only thing we really need to do is record the number of times we've gone around the circle. This way, we will know when the data has wrapped around the end of the buffer and we need to look at the beginning again. Now that we have the code for sending and receiving transmissions, we need to connect module to our computer. We do this via an FTDI adapter. To enable the adapter, we really only need to connect 
two pins. Receive and transmit need to be connected to pins 9 and 10. The receive pin of the FTDI adapter needs to connect to pin 9 of our module. And the transmit pin of the FTDI adapter needs to be connected to pin A10 of our module. This is how it will look. In this case, the ST-Link module is still providing power. Otherwise, you would also want to connect the PCC and ground pins of the FTDI adapter module as well. Once again, here we have our GDB terminal. On the other side here, I have an additional terminal where we can run Minicom. Once we tell our device to go ahead and go, we will see that once a second, it is giving us an additional message. The blink line is an echo of the data that is received so far. As so I type here, we see that initially nothing is happening. The reason for this is a quirk of Minicom. It is expecting an additional signal to be given to it through hardware. To change this behavior, we go Control A into the Options menu. So we will want to configure Minicom here. O, go down to Serial Port Setup, and here we see that hardware flow control is turned on. Turn that off by pressing the F button. And now we will see that some data has been transmitted over to our device. You see that because I have set a breakpoint in the receive complete callback function. Exit out of here. If you want, you can save this as a permanent setting. In order to do this, you will need to run Minicom in pseudo mode. For now, we'll just do exit configuration. You will see now we're having echoed. In this case, the receive buffer is fairly short and I've made it short for the purposes of this demo. Once again, we are in the receive complete callback. Here's the data that I'm typing. Having the FTDI connected to the STM32 module as an additional benefit. I've had it happen a couple times that the STM module has become unresponsive, basically bricked. This happens when somehow the device gets into some crazy state and open OCD is no longer able to communicate with it. An effective way to recover these devices is to use the bootloader that ST has included on these parts. To enable the bootloader, in this particular module, all you need to do is move this jumper down here over to the other setting. It's the jumper that's closest to the pin header. Once you have the jumper moved over to put the device into bootloader mode, simply run this command, erase the flash. At that point, the OCD should be able to reconnect to your device. So once again, in this video, I've talked about how to take the STM32 blue pill connected to a cheap TDI interface, along with some simple code generated mostly by STM32 cube MX, as well as some additions in your main file, which when loaded onto the device, in this case, I forgot to move the bootloader jumper. If we then reload, we have now loaded the device with our UART code, continue receiving the messages once again from the module. And as before, it echoes back to me the things that I told it, and my breakpoint is still active. I hope you have found this video useful. Look for the other videos in this series, the six ways to talk to the STM32.